Hey, welcome here. Uh, I just have a few quick thoughts about God's sovereignty and the role that we who follow Jesus in the middle of a pandemic have. And so uh, there are three scriptures I want to share with you today. Uh, the first comes from Psalm 22, which if you want to hear more about my thoughts on that, uh, you can watch my other video. But there's this line in Psalm 22, verses 2 to 3 that says, My God, I cry out during the day, but you don't answer. Even at night time, I don't stop. You are the Holy One enthroned. You are Israel's praise. I woke up in the middle of the night a few days ago, and that line, you are the Holy One enthroned, was stuck in my mind. Like, who is Jesus? Jesus is the Holy One enthroned. So in Revelation, there's this amazing picture of Jesus uh, on the throne while the seas, which represent chaos and powers, are stilled. Revelation 12 tells us that Jesus is the one in whom there is all salvation, all power and authority, and the kingdom of God is here with him. I just, I find so much comfort in that. I love to know that my Jesus is the king, that he is victorious. I love that Jesus is the bringer of peace and healing and hope, and that in everything that is happening now, that has happened in the past, and everything that is still to come, Jesus is not threatened. There is no rival who can take Jesus from the place that he has won. Uh, we're in the season of Lent right now. We're moving towards remembering that decisive moment on Good Friday when Jesus won the war against the devil and all those who would seek to disrupt God's peace. And that is good news. Um, but there's this other verse that's been on my mind a lot, and, and I just want to give some background to that. Um, so on Palm Sunday, the crowds gathered and they celebrated this king who was coming. Uh, and in five days, they realized that Jesus is not the sort of king that they were expecting, and they actually turn on him. Uh, they wanted someone who was going to rule the way other kings ruled. I, I think sometimes as Christians, we still take that old notion of kings and power and we put them on Jesus. So in Revelation, there's this declaration that says, like, look, there's the lion of Judah. And when John turns, there is no lion. There's only a slaughtered lamb. Uh, Jesus doesn't become a lion after his resurrection. Jesus is still the lamb who was slain. And so as people's lives are being upended, as we see the death toll grow, as the situation gets more and more dire, there are some Christians who are still looking for a lion. Uh, maybe they say things like this, well, this is all God's will. Or God is sovereign and in control, don't worry. Uh, sometimes even the worst thing maybe we say is like, God is causing COVID like he did the plagues in Egypt. Uh, there are streams of our faith that talk about the sovereignty of God. And they have this big idea that because God is all-powerful and all-knowing, God must control everything that happens. So here's the thing. For many reasons, I find myself in a stream of other Christians who just simply argue that that math, all-powerful plus all-knowing equals total control, just doesn't add up. It is not the most true of what we read in the Bible. And actually, I just find the idea uh, fairly appalling that the God of love revealed to us in Jesus would cause a virus that targets the weakest and most vulnerable in the world. Uh, I don't think of God as the one who hits a button on a machine and then everything happens just as it was designed, uh, partly because that kind of thinking didn't exist in the minds of anyone who wrote the Bible. The Bible just wasn't a mechanical world. There weren't those sorts of things. Rather, what we see in the biblical world is that there were certainly kings and monarchs and rulers who had absolute power and might. But that doesn't mean that everything that happened in their kingdom was the will of the king. In fact, kings constantly had to go out and put down rebellions of those who would rise against the power of the king. So for me, God's sovereignty means that God has control of the final outcome, that God will bring about a new heaven and a new earth, and that the end of this story is certain. However, here and now, there are millions of things, big and small, that happen every day that rebel against God's will and design, and they cause horror and destruction, big and small. So that finally leads me to this second passage that has just been coming to me as I think about the character of God and the reality of our world right now. Matthew 13, 24 to 28. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like someone who planted good seed in his field. And while people were sleeping, an enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat and went away. When the stalk sprouted and bore grain, then the weeds also appeared. And the servants of the landowner came to him and said, Master, didn't you plant good seed in your field? Like, how is it that there are weeds? 
So just pause there. Like, doesn't that feel like the question we want to ask about our world right now? Like, God, didn't you make a good world? Aren't you good? Like, are you actually a bad farmer whose wheat is defective? Like, aren't you in control? What, what is with all these weeds? Why, what, God, did you just trick us? And what's the answer? Why are there weeds in a good field that God has made? Well, Jesus' answer in verse 28 is really simple. It says an enemy has done this. And so just so we don't miss it, when Jesus explains the parable to his disciples a few verses later, Jesus says in verse 39, the enemy who planted them is the devil. So now the sovereignty of God is revealed in this parable. The end of the, in the explanation of the parable, Jesus promises that the day is coming when he will come and gather all that is evil, all the weeds, and he will destroy them forever. And the righteous will shine like the sun in the Father's kingdom. So the end is certain. God is victorious. God is sovereign. God will redeem and restore and heal everything. And for me, when I say God is sovereign, what I mean is that the end is secure and that God will bring it to be. But we are not living in the end. We are in the middle. We are still living with weeds and wheat growing alongside each other. We live in a time like in Revelation 12, 12, where it says, The devil has come down to you with a great rage, for he knows that he only has a short time. We live in a time when our enemy is still creating as much destruction and death and sorrow as possible. The weeds of sin and death are growing and choking what is good. And at the same time, our hope as Christians is found as we walk towards Easter with this great promise that Jesus' work in 1 John 3, 8, it just says Jesus' mission on earth was this. God's Son appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. And so Jesus is the king enthroned. But there are things happening in this world that he does not control or will, and, but are actually the result of our great enemy, the accuser, the devil, who is seeking to destroy us and the world. Which leads me to one last scripture that I want to share with you today. Uh, And it's just, we want to ask the question, given that Jesus is on his throne, given that there is an enemy who is wrecking the world, how are we supposed to live in this world then? And so this scripture has been sticking with me for the last few weeks. It comes from Judges 6. So there's this great oppression of Israel by a rival country. And a man named Gideon is hiding and sneaking and trying to not to be discovered and have his food stolen and be abused and all those other things. And God shows up to him and the conversation goes like this. Judges 6, verse 13, But Gideon replied to him, With all due respect, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? Where are the amazing works that our ancestors recounted to us, saying, Didn't the Lord bring us out from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and allowed Midian to overpower us. And then the Lord turned to him and said, You have strength, so go, rescue Israel from the power of Midian. Am I not personally sending you? And then in verse 16, the Lord says, Because I am with you, you'll defeat the Midianites, just as if they were one person. So I love Gideon's honesty. Like, I love this question. No offense. Uh, With all due respect, this sucks. This is garbage. Like, why don't you do any of the cool stuff like my ancestors told me you did? Like, why don't you just swallow up the army like in the Great Sea like you did last time? Why don't you just act on your own and make this all go away? Why don't you just stop the virus from spreading? And the reason is God's plan, A, B, and C, is to partner with his people to make things happen in this world. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9 says, God is faithful, and you are called by him to partnership with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So you and I are being called to be agents of God's peace and reconciliation and hope and healing and rescue in the world. So while we don't get to answer the question, why is this all happening? though I would suggest to you that the most likely answer is that an enemy has done this. We do have a job to do. We are called to help extend the rule of Jesus who is enthroned. Now that doesn't mean Jesus just sits back on his throne and sends us to go do the work. The promise is that the king is going to come down from the throne and work with and through you and me. And so if I was just going to summarize it, I would just say like, look, Jesus is securely on his throne and he is fully in control of the end of the story. Our enemy, the devil, is in a rage because of his defeat, and he is sowing weeds in God's good field. And our role is to partner with Jesus in his victory, in working with him to bring healing and reconciliation and peace and freedom to the world. And so I hope that for you and I, we're not going to be people who just sit back and complain about the way things are. We're not going to just sit back and say, well, God, you're in control. It's all for your glory, whatever. Uh, This is all good because you're in control. No, because you and I are called to be part of the solution. 
You and I are called to enter into the places we can to bring God's rule and reign to life. So I'll close with this. Uh, uh, we pray the Lord's Prayer at our church every week. And uh, N.T. Wright observes that when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we are recalling the events from his life and ministry, and in effect are declaring that we too want to be part of Jesus' mission. The focus begins to turn from our worries towards his work in the world, and we are reoriented towards his will as the main view on the horizon. So we want to work to bring God's will on earth as it is in heaven, and may that be true in our lives. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again.